Welcome to HT504. I'm thrilled to have you here and welcome to this beginning discussion that will introduce us to this wonderful journey we'll be on throughout this course. We're going to talk about introduction to theological interpretation. And in this course, we're going to wrestle with the idea that God reveals himself. Yes. Okay. We're agreed on that. If you're in this class, we're agreed on that. Other people in the world may not be agreed on that, but here you are. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna say God does reveal himself. But what do we do with that? And this is where the challenge comes in a lot of uh, what we wrestle with in church work or in other ministry or in other places versus how we are trying to deepen our awareness and understanding of God's revelation. We begin with the idea that we do interpret this. God reveals himself. But we hear that through certain lenses. We read the text of scripture through certain experiences and certain priorities. And so there is no sense that we can be purely objective and receive God's revelation in a pure, equal form as God reveals it. Because if we did that, we would be God or we would be equal to God. We have to understand that in our limitations, in our mortality, in our experiences in this world that affect us in good and bad ways, we're going to take the material and read it in a certain way that might be different than other people. And sometimes we may be wrong, they may be wrong. Sometimes we may both be right, but looking at it through the different lenses. And so how do we talk about what these lenses are is not a <clears throat> secondary matter, really a way of coming to terms with an honesty about ourselves so that in reading from people we may disagree with in reading people we may have a similar perspective with but but don't know how to understand if we're right or wrong or we're challenged this is a way of first understanding that we are coming to theology as a community and a community means interpreting in different ways community means interpreting in, in light of different concerns or experiences but where do we start with well different traditions throughout church history have come at this topic in different ways so this really is a is a lecture that's meant to encourage self-reflection in your part there's there's nearly no one right way to do with theological interpretation there's wrong ways <laughs> but there's really no right way and so as we begin this course i want to encourage you to think about the ways that you are bringing to the table i'm going to encourage some perspectives that i'm going to offer throughout this course as a priority and as a way of starting i want to give you a sense of how to receive, understand, hear the material that may be different from your fellow students, that may be different from other people, but allows us a way to enter into conversations in a collegial way, even in a hospitable way. So let's jump in. So how do we approach theological interpretation? There's been a lot of different ways to approach theology. Um, we could talk about those ways and fill up a whole semester's class. Some approaches to this course might do that, giving more of a hist history of theological interpretation. But that's not what my goal is. That's not this class. This class isn't a history of theological interpretation. It's not a way of, of me sharing with you all the ways people have approached Christian theology in the last 150 years. That's, a, that's, a, that's part of it, and we're going to talk about that a, a little bit. But it, it's a contemporary Christian theology class. What is the this all mean for us? How does how do the questions and issues and concerns that have shaped theological discussion over the last 150 years led us to the context we're in so that where we're at is being shaped by all these thoughts and discussions even if you don't know it even if you don't know a lot of the theologians that we'll, we'll talk about if you've never heard of them they've shaped the discussion, they've shaped the questions, they've responded to issues, and sometimes they've added more problems, sometimes they've solved issues and questions. And so one reason the discussions move on is because people have wrestled with these in the past, which is likewise a reason to, to talk about them, not in as much depth as probably we should, but to introduce you. This class is going to be a lot of introductions to help you see uh, the way the conversations have been shaped to help you see how things have been formed and in in doing that give you a sense of why 
we are the way we are? Why is theology the way it is? Why do we have the issues and questions that we have? Why do we have the hang-ups we have? So I'll begin the discussion with a few examples that help shape some of the main trajectories of theological interpretation over the centuries. This isn't going to be a thorough approach, and there are probably a lot of different other paths we can take these are the these are some that have been interesting to me two that that shape more of a historical uh, approach and one that I'm going to propose that I think is helpful for a contemporary era in light of, of those other earlier models so Eastern Orthodox which most of you are not familiar with but has been provides a very helpful way of understanding theology in a holistic sense the Wesleyan approach the approach I'll feature in this class is one that I'm calling pneumatological triangulation. That's a good word. Fun thing about theology is you can come up with good phrases that sound really impressive. Um, so feel free to write that down. It's not as complicated as it sounds. Um, and I'll walk you through what this means. And it's something uh, my, my hope is that you'll practice in your weekly assignments. So it's a fun phrase. Feel free to use it with your friends. Feel free to use it with your family. They'll, they'll, they'll think you're getting a lot out of your education. More simply put, because theology should be able to be put more simply, even if it all isn't always put that way in the beginning, I will propose a method of theological discernment that examines a threefold work of the Spirit in us and in this world, and I suggest that this is a, a more contemporary way of dealing with theology in light of the complexity of the world around us. Get to know this one, because again, I want you to use it in your responses. So, I'll give you a time. Repeat after me, pneumatological triangulation. See, it's pneumatological triangulation. See, it sounds fun. It, let your, let your lips wrap around that word. Uh, feel, don't, you, don't you feel your, your intelligence rising? There you go. Begin with the Eastern Orthodox approach. Vladimir Lasky, a 20th century Orthodox writer, summed up the approach of Eastern Orthodox thought, which is the, the church as it developed beginning around the year 1000 in the eastern part of the, of the former Roman Empire, what was North Africa in parts, uh, what is now Turkey, much of which has been taken over by Islam as the, as the chief religion, but we still see Orthodoxy very strong in, in places such as Russia, or Greece, Armenia. He comes from it in a different way than most Western theologians might. He argues, Christianity is not a philosophical school for speculating about abstract concepts, but is essentially a communion with the living God. A lot of Western theology thinks Christianity is a philosophical school, or Christian theology is, uh, for speculating about ab abstract concepts. But for the Eastern approach, it goes beyond the intellect. What does it mean to live with God? What does it mean to commune with God? That's involving our mind and our heart. What does it mean to commune with anyone? to truly live in communion with someone. Well, that's what theology is. That's what Christianity is. It's a communion with the living God that begins at the moment of our salvation and proceeds throughout eternity in an ever-increasing way in which God invites us into his presence and invites us to commune with him. For Lasky, theology is by its very nature mystical. Now, don't let the word mystical throw you off. Some, it's, it's been used and misused in a lot of ways, and a lot of the ways it's been misused have, has been noted by other Christian uh, leaders or pastors or others as saying there, there's no use for mysticism because they're approaching the word in, in a way that has been defined by other religions or other philosophies. When Lasky uses the word mystical, we're not saying that it's somehow caught up in all these fal uh, false philosophies, the kind that Paul mentions in, in, for instance, Colossians. But instead, theology is by its very nature caught up with things that go beyond our senses, that go beyond our ability to grasp, that, that involve a part of, part of us that involves our spirit, our soul, however you want to describe this inner reality and, and insight into things that are beyond our awareness. He contends that theology is rooted first in religious experience. We experience God. What is the experience of God like? What is salvation like? It's not purely an intellectual or social experience. There's something that is in us that brings us beyond our present reality. And that religious experience then leads us into, the, into theology, leads us into questions about God, leads us into ways of wrestling with what we have been experiencing. 
The goal of the Christian, then, is not so much to have a philosophical understanding of the divine, but rather to reach the point of union with God. We don't understand God, we enter into communion with God. Well, that's a nice, different way of coming to terms with theology. What does theology mean? It's, it's not a set of facts, but it's a way of growing in relationship. And when you grow in relationship, it involves learning, but it also involves your heart. And it also involves your responses. What does it mean to live fully and completely in an ever, ever more full way in union with God? Now, we can't, we can't really experience that in this life. Probably not. We're broken. We're sinful. But God is calling us and the Spirit is filling us to begin this process. Again, the modern era emphasized a binary on and off, yes or no, in communion or not in communion. Well, the contemporary approach, it allows us to think in terms of this more easily. We can't get to complete union, but we can have more union. We can't have complete communion and be completely perfect, but we can improve, we can grow, we can enter into a stronger relationship as God works in us and through us. So for this to occur in an Eastern Orthodox approach, the Christian must learn how to become completely detached from human understanding. Our minds lead us away. We, when we try to grasp something purely with our indirect intellect, it, we, it brings in distortions. It misleads us. It, it, it brings misunderstandings about God that tend to reflect more our hang-ups or our goals or our problems. So true theology in an Eastern Orthodox conception is relational. Again, knowing God is being in communion with God. It's not having a set of facts that we can put a check mark next to. It's a way we live. Are we in relationship with God? That's not how we're to say nothing can be said about God. While we can't know who God is, we can know what God does. We can experience God in his revelation. This is what scripture tells us. It's not a set of facts. It's a story. It's a narrative. It's telling us what God has done. And in confronting us that, with that story, how God has worked in the course of history, we learn how God continues to work in our lives and beyond our lives and in this world past, present, and future. We experience God and we can integrate these experiences with our words about him. If you are a theologian, you will pray truly. And if you pray truly, you are a theologian. That's something a Christian leader in the early centuries of the church named Evagrius of Pontus said. And it really emphasizes this idea that theology is really about communion with the living God. And that you can have a lot of facts, and you can have a lot of ideas, and you can have a lot of complicated sentences and complex words with many syllables and say a lot about God but you don't really know God and you may not be talking about the God who is if you are truly a theologian it's not just words about God it's a way of relating to God it's a way of relating with God it's words to God you will pray truly what is what does theology mean it means being able to talk about the God who is and reflecting this in the all of life. And if you do this, then you know God. Then you can say that you are a theologian maybe better than some who have high academic posts because in talking about God, you're living it out in a relationship. If you're a theologian, you will pray truly, and if you pray truly, you are a theologian. That's a good place to start. And it's an encouragement for those of us who may have a lot of words and degrees and be able to write complicated sentences and uh, interact with very intellectual ideas, it's good because it's humbling, because it reminds me that all these words are nothing if I don't live it out, that what I say to you is meaningless if I'm not practicing it behind the scenes. And it's an encouragement to you, in as much as you are seeking after God, yearning for God's work in your life, that you are asking questions. They may not have the sophistication or language or all those other things that you might find in some of our readings, but they're real and they're true and they're coming from your heart and they're reflecting your own context and issues and questions and you're seeking for truth and you're seeking for truth in seeking God. Well, you too are a theologian and the goal in this class is essentially to bring these approaches in dialogue. What does it mean to live this life out? How can we uh, relate to each other and interact with each other so that your context and questions can learn from the context of academics and 
people who have wrestled with their own context and questions and, and offered helpful ideas. And in that, how do we pray truly? If you're a theologian, you will pray truly, and if you pray truly, you are a theologian. We're going to cover a lot of ground and a lot of uh, difficult and sometimes complex things. This quote, because I think it's essential, it reminds us of what our true goal is. The picture here is uh, A Walk at Dusk by Caspar David Friedrich, and this picture was important in my own spiritual life. There was a time when I was in seminary and working at churches that I was really burned out. The church I was at I, had been my home church, and it was going through a very dysfunctional time of, of leadership and confusion over who it was, what it what felt it was called to be and do. People were leaving. I had friends who were becoming very discouraged, people who were very excited about God and God's work being alienated. And um, I was participating in this and working in leadership, and I didn't know how to navigate what I felt was true in my own Christian life and Christian ministry and what I was experiencing. And I went to the Giddy uh, in Los Angeles. If you've not been there, I highly recommend it. And I was just walking through as a way of just getting away from academics and getting away from church stuff and just trying to find somewhere different. And I s walked into this room and there was this small painting. And I looked at it and it just caught my eye and then it caught my heart. And I stood staring at it for quite a while. And it's this one. It spoke to my soul in a way that so many other things hadn't. And at the time, I wrestled with why. It just resonated. This is what I was seeking. I felt like I could identify with this monk, and yet in the busyness and the chaos and the frenzy I was around, I was missing this. I was missing my walk with God. We don't know where he was. this, this man is coming from or where he was going. We don't know his story. We just see him in this space, this walk with God, on his way from somewhere to somewhere, caught up in maybe prayer or thoughts. That's what theology has inspired me towards, getting away from the frenzy and chaos and finding this way of walking with God again. Walking with God in stillness, in quiet, so that when we're called to live out this Christian life in the rest of this world, we're in places of chaos and frenzy, we can bring this contemplation with us. We can be voices of stillness, of encouragement, of renewal, of peace, peace, hope, patience. Find an image. What image works with you? Go beyond the intellectual, and even in this course, find an image that's inspirational and keep it before you and say, this is how you can conceive of the Christian life, or maybe a song. In my classroom courses, I often play uh, some jazz in the background. Feel free to turn that on. Have something that leads you outside of the purely intellectual trap and inspires you as we seek something that's bigger than us, that's bigger than academics, that's bigger than a grade. If you are a theologian, you will pray truly. And if you pray truly, you are a theologian. God, I do pray for us in this class, for all those students who are listening to this, wherever they are at. May you be with them. May you be an encouragement as they begin. May you help them to process all the challenges of life and see this not only as yet another challenge, but as a place of potential renewal, of learning, that as we encounter the deep, hard questions that often have an academic bent and intellectual side, that you would give us all an understanding of how to process this in a way that makes sense in our lives and in our prayers and in the questions that we wrestle, wrestle with. May you be with us in every step in the way, reminding us that we're here because of you, to walk with you and communion with you. Thank you, God. Amen. Let's press on. Another approach to theological interpretation is Wesleyan quadrilateral. It involves scripture. You start with scripture. You add tradition. What have people thought about scripture in the course of the last 2,000 years? We say the Spirit works in giving us wisdom through scripture. And the Spirit hasn't started working in our era with us. The Spirit's been working in generations before us. And so wrestling with how people have, have encountered the words, Word of God in scripture is important and helps us process our questions. Many of the questions we have have been answered already, and tradition gives us an orientation. Many of the things we might think of have been wrestled with and shown to be wanting by people in the past, and we should be aware of that. But we're also called to bring our own selves into this, to think about things, to uh, study scripture, to study tradition, to wrestle with the, the signs of the times around us, the, the issues and questions and concerns that, that shape who we are. And we're called to wrestle with this in a way that leads us to a greater understanding. And bring our, not only our minds into this, but bring our experiences into this. Bring our own experience with God. What is your experience with God? How has God worked in your life? How has God worked in the lives around you? 
How has God not worked? Which ways are you frustrated? Uh, which ways lead you into questioning more of God rather than um, embracing God? Those are those are important area, areas, and theology doesn't shy away from that. So it's not a phrase used by Wesley, Wesley and Quadrilateral, but it's rather how a scholar, first Albert Utler, described Wesley's functional approach to developing and arguing theological positions throughout his works. So it's not something Wesley set out to do, it's just a way he gathered his own understanding in approaching theology, always re reflecting on scripture and then tradition and then reason and then experience. How do we visualize this? Well, you could see it as these separate boxes, each forming a nice square and separate. Or in terms of foundation, you, you start with scripture. And then on scripture, you build tradition. And on tri tradition, you build reason and experience. Foundationalism is a very modern approach. Or you can see it as a web, which is more of a contemporary postmodern approach. You have theology that is formed by being placed in this these mutually interacting forms. Reason interacts with tradition. Scripture interacts with experience. Experience interacts with scripture and reason and tradition. All these things aren't separate pieces that, that are isolated, but are always constructed in light of each other. And as these form a web together, theology emerges in the context. Or you can see it as lenses. Oh, it's a way of viewing the world. It's a va way of viewing uh, certain ideas or questions. So, for instance, if you've, if you've ever had an eye exam, how they put that little uh, machine in front of your head and then say, is this one better? They, they put different lenses in front and, and give different ways of seeing the world. Um, if you add different color lenses on a camera, you, you, you change how things are viewed. Uh, and so adding these different lenses gives a new perspective, filling it out, maybe healing it. Um, so we, the, the lens of scripture, the lens of reason, the lens of experience, the lens of tradition, they don't all cover the same ground or have the same view, but we can find an overlapping help. Or, just, you know, there's just a lot of different ways. How does each element function in constructing a cohesive theology for the church? How have you seen these work out in your traditions or in your context? How do you see these working out as you wrestle with the, the idea of theology? What does Christianity argue? If we're going to believe in Christianity or not believe in Christianity, we should at least begin with the idea of actually knowing what it is that Christianity asserts. What is Christian theology? A lot of the arguments against Christianity that I've heard aren't really Christian. They're arguing against uh, distortions of Christianity or corruptions or ignorance. Uh, there's a lot of ignorance in churches. There's a lot of ignorance in, in popular media and in uh, popular church media. Bad theology abounds. Goal is to have good theology and so using these lenses is a helpful way. So in, in light of this I propose a different model of triangulation that looks at elements that I think have been important throughout Christian history though not always brought together as tightly, with one being emphasized much more than the other, and also reflects, I argue, an emphasis in scripture of how we are to understand God and God's work and God's plan and uh, how we are to understand who God is. So in light of this, we triangulate discernment. Orthodoxy. Orthos means right and true and straight. Doxa means opinions, beliefs, right beliefs. So the Spirit leads us into having a right beliefs, right understanding. And this is the element that theology has traditionally emphasized almost exclusively, especially over the last uh, century and uh, really even through most of Christian history. This is the one that that's allowed people to say they were part of the church or not part of the church. This is where people are called heretics, usually if they're not uh, believing the right thing um, according to what the church has stated is the right thing. But there's more. I think in emphasizing only the intellectual element, we've lost sight of the broader understanding of scripture and also the broader understanding of what does it mean to be a person. In emphasizing only the intellectual, we, we highlight one important element of what it means to be human and understanding God. But in making it exclusive, we leave out a lot of other things and let the orthodoxy then itself get distorted, not in being wrong beliefs, but in how it's applied how we understand it to lead our life. What does it mean for us to believe these things? And in doing that, we let the beliefs then become distorted by actions, by thoughts, by feelings, by how our responses to others, or by our responses to our own questions and concerns and behavior. So to add to orthodoxy, I propose that we add two other elements. One, orthopathy, pathos, which is the Greek word for emotions, passion, suffering. 
And in this, I would argue it means right feelings. We're called to have right feelings about something. We're called, our emotional selves are a big part. To say that uh, we can take our emotions away is uh, arrogant in some ways, especially as, as some people are more driven by their emotional insight and discernment than their intellectual. And also, even for those who pride themselves on strong intellectual development, they're still emotional. There's still emotional responses. Everything throughout history, all human interactions are led and driven in a big part by our emotional state, our psychological state, how we respond to how we're being treated, how, we're, how we respond to situations, how others are being treated, and understanding our emotional context and how God works in our emotional context is a huge element. And with this then too, we have, what do we do with it? Orthopraxy, right actions. Right actions are a way of expressing our beliefs, putting our beliefs into action is, is making our beliefs real. Do we really believe something if our, our actions don't reflect this? So our actions reflect our beliefs, our beliefs lead into our actions, and only in understanding all three of these together, I argue, can we have a truly coherent understanding of God's work in this world, in our life, in a way that's coherent and has integrity with those around us. Here's a, a image, this is where the triangulation image came from in, in my mind. Uh, it's cell phones. How do, uh, if you have a cell phone, they can find you, um, which is, I guess is a little scary if you don't want to be found, but uh, most of us don't worry about that, and if we're lost, it's helpful. How do they do that? How, how does triangulation work with cell phone technology or with uh, other forms of technology throughout the ages? Um, it's a way of tracking something by saying if you have three different points, then where they intersect is the line of truth. This is this is where this is where the the person can be found or the location can be found. So the first tower judges the distance to the caller, who could be anywhere on the circle. The, the second tower does the same. So uh, then you have two distances, and in tracking those and in aligning those two, you have a, you have a, a beginning of a fixed point. Then the third tower pinpoints the location by having these three points. They balance each other out. They they give added information that fills in gaps of the other. If you only have orthodoxy for one instance, you can tell where someone is on a narrow range of what it means to be Christian, our intellect, our thoughts, what do we believe about Jesus, what do we believe about God. But as you read in the Gospels, Jesus is concerned much more than that. How do we respond to others? How are we responding to moral questions, ethical questions? Who are we in our private lives? All three of those elements are part of what it means to be Christian. So I begin with orthodoxy. This comes from John 14, 22 through 26. I encourage you to look it up, honestly, and spend time with this. Don't, don't, whenever I use scripture, don't feel like you have to entirely believe everything I'm saying. I am using these as cues. Uh, the nice thing about an online course is it allows you to stop and pause and think and consider. So John 14, 22 through 26. Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. So what will the Holy Spirit teach us? Everything. What will the Holy Spirit remind us of? All that Jesus has said to, uh, to you. That's a lot. So we say, one of the core missions of the Spirit is to give knowledge and understanding about God. Again, this isn't as uh, a theological point separated from Scripture. This is Scripture. This is Jesus himself saying this. We know we can have right understanding about God what God wants of us because the Spirit gives us this knowledge. We can pray and the Spirit will work in us and through us and give us this knowledge. Maybe through others, maybe through friends, maybe through uh, uh, colleagues or pastors or whoever. Um, but the Spirit works and how the Spirit works is to give us an understanding about God. So the, a course in theology we can say is a participant if we're all open, me and you to this work, the idea that the Holy Spirit is giving us knowledge and understanding about God, even an academic -like course like this can be a spiritual experience. And it should be, I think. This is theology, words about God. More on orthodoxy. 
1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things. But such a person is not subject to merely human judgments, for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Again, orthodoxy, right beliefs. How do we know what it, has, it, it is to have a right belief about God, about this world? God's the creator. So when we think about right beliefs, what, is we, what do we think about what is happening in this world? What are we called to do? It's not simply about having the right set of doctrines that we can sign off on, on complicated theories or questions of philosophy uh, that, that have been asked over the centuries. It's really also a matter of how, what should we believe about what's going on in our life right now? What should we believe about what's going on in the community around us? How should we understand a crisis? Is it something that we've done that's a sin? Is it something that is a test? Is it just something that we're involved in as part of our own training? How do we understand what's, who we're called to be and where we're called to go? These, this is an issue of orthodoxy. It's wisdom. It's understanding. It's knowledge about who God is, about what God is doing in our life. It's about our calling, our mission. Yes, it's also about some uh, issues of who Jesus is, his personality. How is God shaped in his own self? It's the idea of Trinity, the idea, the idea of Christ's nature as fully God, as fully human. Those are two are issues of orthodoxy, but it goes beyond that in understanding all of reality and what he requires of us. Moving on to orthopathy. Galatians 5, 13 through 25. This is a, a, a passage that I think is key because orthopathy is not nearly as talked about in cer certainly church history and even contemporary theology. Very few classes on theology would ever even bring something like this up. This is, this is pretty new and yet I think is essential in understanding a holistic doctrine of theology in its contemporary sense and in a holistic sense. Our feelings matter. For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. The fruit here is singular. It's not that you have these separate little things that uh, uh, you add a, a fruit bowl and um, you have the fruit of love, the fruit of joy, fruit of peace, these different things, and you can have maybe five or uh, five of them, but not all of them, and you know, uh, 
diff different blends. It's one fruit, and this one fruit has all these elements included. I inasmuch as we have the whole fruit of the Spirit, these things come together. Love is connected to joy, is connected to peace, is connected to self-control, is connected to kindness, is connected to generos generosity. These things fill and inform each other as one fruit, fr one fruit with nine parts. 1 Corinthians 13 ends with this, this, this famous chapter, And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these of, is love. But this raises a question. Um, love is emphasized all throughout the, the, the Gospels and all throughout the New Testament. But what is love? If love is the very definition of the law, is love a right understanding about something? Do you, if you say, I'm in love with someone, are you saying that you have the right beliefs about them? Um, that you understand who they are? No. Um, what is love? Think of a time that you've been in love. Or think of a time or, or someone that you do love now. Think of a family member. Think of a friend that you love. Um, how would you describe that? Is it intellectual? Is it actions? No, we can do things that look like, that are kind to each other and not love someone. But what category is love in? It's a deep part of ourselves. It goes, it's it's an inner part of our reality that isn't simply our intellectual side. It involves our mind, but is is a deeper reality of who we are. It involves trust and commitment and these core elements of us in in wanting the best for another. What is it? What is it like to be in love? What is it like to love someone? You yearn for them. You want to be with them. You value them. That's an emotional component. We are emotional social creatures, and our emotional social side is also part of God's work. And if this is true, then the transformation that the Spirit does in us involves our emotional and social side as well. So how do we respond right with and among others? How do we know what, what's happening in a given context? God transforms even our understanding of our emotions. And to have the right understanding and the right emotional component is itself part of what it means to have a right theology, to pray truly, to be in communion with God. Remember that love is the ultimate goal and the criteria of the law and all of theology. And so in leaving out these idea of right feelings or right emotions, a lot of theology has missed its own core element. Orthopathy, right feelings. Look at this is picture. This is a picture of, of me and my uh, daughter. This is an older picture. She was a little over a year old when this picture was taken her first time at the beach. Look at that expression in her eyes. Look at my response. This is love. How do you describe that? Do I say she, we are genetically connected and I know that I have a responsibility for her as a father? Well, yeah, but is that this expression? No, there's delight, there's joy, there's a peace in this. Orthopathy, right feelings, love, joy, peace, hope. How do we know where God is working? Um, our emotional emotions are, are part of that. And we can be in a hard circumstance but, be, but feel a great deal of peace when it's a, when it's a place that God wants us. We, yeah, we can be in, in very easy circumstances and feel tension and discouragement because we're called to be or do something else and we're not doing it and we feel this lack of, of the Spirit's rest. The modern era was very distrustful of feelings and, and assumed that the intellect was the only guide, which is alienating towards people who really are driven by their emotional side and have, have a strong sense of feelings and empathy. Be, because emotions are a part of human perception, both good and bad, and may, and I think are part of God's work in and with us. Now, of course, like with thought and, and intellect, our emotions aren't always trustworthy, and so orthopathy is a way of leading us into not only having and experiencing the right emotions, but but knowing how to discern what is an experience of peace that is a peace of God versus an experience of peace that is just us being comfortable. What is joy that is deep and full of God's presence versus joy that is just we're being amused by something. And a good issue, an important issue to talk about, for instance, here is depression. Is being depressed a sign of God's absence? Of course not. I myself have struggled with depression over my life and I know that there are times in which I just feel this darkness and emptiness and it's not that God is absent in my life it's my my uh, neurochemistry is off or I didn't drink enough water or I haven't been exercising or there's a genetic component there with that depression isn't a sign of God's lack it's just like with so much of other our wrestling with our physical selves sometimes we're caught up in our physical weaknesses so learning how to discern where is something that's de depression that is part of 
you know something we may wrestle with versus something that's a depression that's part of feeling God's absence and and feeling a that we've moved away from God those are two different uh, uh, nuances uh, excitement and joy and happiness we can we can uh, amuse ourselves we can you know put drugs into our system we can do all sorts of stuff that stimulate a false joy and a false sense of excitement and value and it, then we crash after that and it leads us feeling empty but that's not the joy of the spirit the joy of the spirit is a fullness and again it can happen you can be joyful and wonderful in hard circumstances you can find peace and hope in the midst of things that look uncertain um, I'm feeling that now in a lot of questions in my own life. There, there, I, I really have a hope that God's working, even though on the surface there are things that seem impossible as I look f towards this next year. So orthopathy is a guide to discernment. Like with intellect, we have to train our understanding of our emotions, the nuances, learn to, to understand where God's work and what does it mean to experience the fullness of the Spirit as opposed to uh, feeling emotions in other ways. Uh, for, I, I think sexuality is very close to our experience of spirituality in our mind and sometimes we can be excited for the wrong reason and put some spiritual language in that. This is, this is common in Christian circles. Uh, so how do, we, how do we nuance what is just our human yearnings versus a spiritual yearning? Uh, it's difficult. But it doesn't mean it's impossible because we say that if this is the fruit of the Spirit, then these are elements that are the part and not only part but are core experiences of what it means to walk with the Spirit. So it's a calling for us to understand orthopathy. This is something that's part of the Wesleyan tradition, certainly. And while not emphasized in a lot of theological circles, it's a core element of Wesley's own story. We have what's called his Aldersgate experience, which is part of his journals. Uh, I won't go into the whole history of Wesley, but it's enough to say that he, for his whole life he was raised in a Christian house. His father, his grandfather were ministers. His mother was a, a wonderful and very thoughtful and exceedingly well-read Christian woman who would give him advice and counsel. He was raised in a very Christian environment. He had his master's degree in theology. And yet a lot of his Christian life was full of struggle and of emptiness, of legalism. And he had this missionary experience in, in the state, in the col then colony of Georgia, which he went there thinking he was serving God and it was just a really bad experience emotionally and socially and spiritually. He just, he, and, and he uh, had just come back to England um, having almost literally run from uh, his past and problems because of some bad romantic experiences that he had. Um, I won't go into that, but it's worth reading. The, the man was really broken, even though he was intellectually as strong of an understanding of Christian thought as almost anyone of his era. And he comes back broken, not knowing what to do, what, where to go. And he writes this in his journal. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistles to the Roman. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. An assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. I began to pray with all my might for those who had, in a more special manner, despitefully used me and persecuted me. I then testified openly to all there what I now first felt in my heart. But it was not long before the enemy suggested, this cannot be faith, for where is thy joy? Then I was taught that peace and victory over sin are essential to the faith in the captain of our salvation, but that as to the transports of joy that usually attend the beginning of it, especially in those who have mourned deeply, God sometimes gives, sometimes withholds them according to the counsels of his own will. After my return home, I was much buffeted with temptations, but I cried out and they fled away. They returned again and again. I as often lifted up my eyes, and he sent me help from his holy place, and herein I found the difference between this and my former ch state chiefly consisted. I was striving, yes, stri fighting with all my might under the law as well as under grace. But then I was sometimes, if not often, conquered. Now I was always conqueror. So Wesley had this experience of the Spirit in which he felt, and in this feeling, this is often called his conversion even though it's strange because he was a Christian his whole life it was a renewal it was a transformation in the feeling it became real so orthopathy was was the moment really his ministry began that moment was seen as as the point that his ministry uh, went from being a lot of words and legalism to taking off to being the kind of movement that spread around the world and yet 
the work of the Spirit is never intended to simply be about giving us right th an understanding and right feeling so that we can sit quietly on our own. You no, know, all throughout the Bible, the Spirit works always for a specific reason, for a mission. The Spirit is this mission of God enacted in the life of people in the church and in this world. And in pressing forward this mission, we experience the understanding of God and who God is and how God works and what God wants of us. We feel the joy, the peace, how to live with and among each other, how to navigate difficult circumstances with a different attitude and emotional state than those around us. We learn how to walk in peace during times of, of trouble rather than chaos. We learn to face questions and issues and concerns so as to press forward with courage. What's the difference between David in facing Goliath and the rest of Israel? It wasn't that he was a great, the best warrior. It's that he was the one who had courage. He was the one who said, this person is not going to stand. God worked in his emotional state. But like with David and like what we see with Wesley, it wasn't ever limited to just having a right uh, idea or, or emotions or feelings. It was always enacted. We are given the right feelings and emotions and understanding so as, we, uh, so as to press forward in a way that's different than those around us, to put it into practice, to put this mission into practice, to live it out, to respond to other people differently, to have a sympathy for people, not so that we can simply feel for them, but that we can come alongside them and assist them in, in their discouragement, so that we can see the poor, so that we can see the hurt, so that we can help each other grow in understanding and wisdom and, and, and other ways so that we become better Christians, so that we can lead others to understanding who Christ is. So we call this orthopraxy, and we begin this discussion with talking about the gifts of the Spirit. I'm not going to read these uh, these sections in full, but again, the benefit of of having this recorded is you can pause this. So I encourage you, open up Romans 12 and read Romans 12 and pause as you read this. Next, read 1 Corinthians 12. Look to see what, how they're similar, how they're different. Look to see what does it mean to, what are the gifts of the Spirit in this passage. Ephesians 4, 2 through 16. Open your Bible and read this. Think about it. Pray about it. First Peter 4, 7 through 11. So orthopraxy. Praxis means right actions. And so having the orthopraxy is doing the right thing in the context that we're in. Uh, spiritual gifts can certainly be part of that. We say we have been given gifts to edify the body, to participate in the church. There is no sense of passivity in the body of Christ. Some churches are organized and structured so that you have a few people doing everything and the most of the people sitting back and receiving, but that's not the nature of the Spirit. In, in any Christian community, everyone has a role. Everyone who's been given the Spirit has a part and, of, and contribution. This may happen on a Sunday morning or it may happen in the context of the community throughout the week. But everyone who has been given the Spirit has a role and part as part of the very Spirit's action. And everyone who is a Christian has been given the Spirit. So we all have a role. We all have a part. Learning what it is that gives you peace and joy. These ortho, orthopathy and ortho Doxy actually can give you an understanding of your orthopraxy. What is the thing that gets you excited? What is the thing that gets you uh, interested? And, and another way of looking at spiritual gifts is what, when you go to the church, what frustrates you what, that, that you're not seeing happen? What, what do you think other people should be doing? What do you notice? Oftentimes those ir issues of anger and frustration in not seeing things done aren't because other people should be doing them. It's because you feel this emotional burden that this needs to be done and you're being called to fill that role. As an interesting thing in light of uh, our churches and other contexts we're in. Don't blame others if you see something that needs to be done. Do it. That might be the call of the Spirit. The orthopraxic response. That's a uh, very theological way of saying do what you're called to do because the Spirit's empowering you to do it. Other things, works of service. Some things we're specially empowered to do. Um, some people are especially good at praying. I I value and realize the importance of prayer, but it's not something that wells up inside of me. It's a discipline. Um, evangelism. I realize how important evangelism is, but it's not something that I have ever been comfortable with. It's something that is is there, but it's other people are exceedingly gifted at that. Other things I am very good at, and 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 seem to be better at than others. 
So we need each other. It, we're not. There's no way any one of us can can fulfill this the functions of the church. We're all called to have strengths, and in having strengths, we also have weaknesses. So in coming together, we give we work with our strengths, and our other people make up for our weaknesses. And only as uh, working together are we filled as a whole. Uh, those are spiritual gifts, but works of service are those things that we're called to do because we're there. Think of the story of the Good Samaritan. Who was? Why is the Good Samaritan mentioned as being the neighbor? Be, not because he had the special gift, or he was the one in relationship, or he had the obligation. He was walking by on the road and saw someone hurt, and he was the guy who helped. That's a work of service. When we're in a setting, it could be our family, it could be in an apartment, it, in our apartment, it could be in a big dramatic setting on a mission field, it could be in a walking by someone who is hurt and needs a, a listening ear. Works of service are being the presence of Christ in the way that Christ would be if Christ himself was there. And through us, through this power of the Spirit in us, we become this messianic presence and are called to be participants with Christ in those settings, being representatives of Christ. We also talk about orthopraxy in terms of holiness, which isn't legalism, it's not being set apart, it's about becoming more whole, more becoming who God has truly made us to be. So personal transformation, ethics, morals, these are all included, but it's bigger than that. Who are we truly called to be? How do we overcome our weaknesses, our temptations, our, our the ways we're broken? We'll, we, we say that we are broken, we say that sin is a deep part of ourselves, but we're not left there. We're never, we, we say that we're sinners in need of forgiveness, but when we find salvation, we don't say Jesus just saves us and then moves on to the next person. In providing the Spirit, we start from a place where Jesus loves us and accepts us as we are. The Spirit works to take us from where we were to who we're called to be, to make us whole, to, to heal us in the ways we need healing. Again, Jesus accepts us, but Jesus is, is always calling us to be more of who he intends us to be, to take up our calling, to overcome the damaged areas, and it's the Spirit who allows us to do this. We're called to build up the church edification. We're called to help those in need. So orthopraxy, the right actions are transformative. Where the Spirit works in us, we're called to be agents of change in that setting. Again, this doesn't have to be a big dramatic way. If everyone really lived this out, everyone has a small influence in their immediate circle, and if everyone is doing this presence of Christ in their immediate circle, then this has a resonating effect in broader and deeper ways, and soon the whole of society is changed, not because we start from the top up, but because we start from the bottom. From, from in the midst of things, you have this resonating change, and it's practical. When we talk about orthopraxy, we're not talking about these big religious or spiritual dramatic acts. Maybe sometimes we are, but oftentimes, if what what is the practical act if someone's hungry? Give them food. What was Jesus' response to the people who were um, dealing with illness or disease? He healed them. Orthopraxy is an expression of good news, not in a religious or philosophical uh, sense that only affects our mind and understanding. It's good news in actually addressing what do we need to hear good news about in our lives? What what are those around us? Think think in terms of the setting you're, that you're at. Think in terms of the context you're at, our city, our community, the apartment building, the the neighborhood, wherever you are or, or whatever you're doing, your work. What is the good news for that setting in which you can be a presence of Christ and bring in, in how you respond to things, in helping people in need, you can bring this presence of Christ so that people experience Christ even before they hear the words of Christ. Does that sound familiar? That's good New Testament stuff right there. It's always expressed in action. If we know God, we act in a way that expresses this. It's not work salvation. It's because we are saved, we live out this salvation in certain ways. John Wesley said something, because God's works we can work. Because God works, we must work. It's the Spirit's presence in us who allows us to be a new kind of person. It's the Spirit's presence in us that compels us to live this out in practical ways throughout every context of our life. Aristotle proposed three essential elements of persuasion that I think overlap some of what we're talking about, which is, is in a way, me trying to connect this uh, 
pneumatological triangulation with a common understanding of wisdom and maybe in this arguing that that this approach really fits a broader perspective of human wisdom that isn't new but really speaks into uh, the human condition that has been understood throughout history he talks about ethos pathos and logos ethos think ethics is about our character are we believable are we trustworthy are we qualified to speak or be seen as authoritative well this can be reflected in our credentials such credentials like for instance i i could say i have a phd in theology so you must believe me when i talk about god they're not really trustworthy especially nowadays when we're suspicious about people who have authority or have credentials do we always believe people do you are you just automatically going to believe everything i say maybe i suspect most of you aren't i don't have illusions about that Postmodern approaches show how rhetoric can be abused by those with privilege or power. So we look to actions. So I think ethos relates most closely in an ancient and contemporary sense to orthopraxy. Are we living out what we say we believe? Uh, it's one thing for me to say, I have a PhD in theology, so you have to believe me. It's another thing for me to share a story about how I responded in a context of suffering or darkness, or how I responded when I didn't have a job, and instead of getting caught up in anxiety, I trusted in faith. It, it, to go through the context of talking about my marriage, how how I live out in, in in a relationship with trust with my wife, with with my kids, those are ways in which you say, okay, he takes this seriously, and and because he takes this seriously, maybe this is something I should take seriously. Do our actions represent faith? And if not faith in God, what do our actions represent faith in? Look at how you live your life. Look at what you've done in the past week. Uh, that's a better way of actually expressing what you actually believe in. Actions speak louder than words. We're bombarded with advertising. What do we truly trust and believe in? Those people who actually prove it by acting it out. Pathos, our feelings, our instincts, essentially, were often dismissed during the modern period, but nowadays how I feel about something is, is used as a greater arbiter of personal truth than some claimed objective fact. I feel, therefore I am, is probably the, the best way of talking about a postmodern declaration. It could be hope and joy, deep emotions. I feel this is true about me. I feel this is who I am. Uh, or negative emotions like anger or frustration. What we feel, what, what someone feels about something is their truth. Likewise, fleeting or fear and despair, deep negatives. Now, maybe this is taking feelings too far in a certain way. This is why we need the other two elements. But this shows how the pathos is really taking a, a central way. Where is our hope, however? What is our fear? If these are not being oriented by the Spirit, then they're being oriented by something else. And we need to understand what these are being oriented by so that we can take our pathos, our passions and feelings, and develop them in a way that is according to the Spirit. Let ourselves be transformed by the Spirit even our emotions, so that our hope is our hope in Christ. Our f fear isn't a fear and in, in anxiety about the world is doing to us. Our fear is a fear of the Lord. Next, logos, our words, we're presenting an argument in logical form. This defined the modern approach to theology and still really is what most people think about when we talk about theology. Theologos, right? I think, therefore I am, Descartes said. Very rational, very orderly. It's often intellectualized and sometimes distant from regular human experiences, which is often di uh, dismissed, and maybe I have done a little bit of that myself so far. And yet this is a key element. Thinking through something is a very human trait. Our ability to rationally consider something, step back from a context and assess it is key. Think in terms of relationships. We can get, get so caught up in emotions and in responding to each other that we, we butt heads, but if you actually step back and understand where someone else is coming from and think through what is it that's driving my response it may not be the thing they did it may be something that happened earlier in the day that i'm taking out on them your our ability to rationally consider these things is what separates us from the animals in so many ways who are driven by their immediate experiences and emotions the question of understanding and persuasion and theological interpretations isn't just a philosophical one and it's not simply just a social one there really is also a historical element to it, because history is a different culture, as one historian once said, and different historical eras are dealing with different kinds of questions and different kinds of concerns and different kinds of life experiences. And so all knowledge, whether it's theology or farming or <laughs> go down the list of issues that people have to deal with in order to navigate life are based on the kinds of experiences and understanding of their part of the world. And so I, I'm going to roughly break down three different over 
overarching eras of human knowledge that reflect very different kinds of understanding about the world. And these different kinds of understandings have sh radically shaped how people were asking questions about God and asking questions about human life. Now, I say these are different eras, but the reality is that these aren't so easily divided into this happened, then it stopped, and then this happened, then it stopped, and then the next one happened, and then it stopped. There is overlapping elements, and different parts of the world could actually still be in different kinds of experiences of this. But this is a general way to understand how theological discussions, especially over the last 2,000 years, both contribute to our knowledge, but also leave themselves open to either critique or simply in insufficiency, because the kinds of questions and concerns people were asking 1,500 years ago were very relevant and helpful, but they're different than what we're dealing with now. And our understanding about the world and our understanding about science may lead us into different kinds of questions, or our own weaknesses are different than what they had. Our strengths are different than they had. So we're going to begin by looking at pre-modernity. In the questions of ultimate reality and ourselves, the pre-modern world's experience was that the world is out to get you. In the contemporary era for most of us, I'm not going to be too uh, sweeping, but I think this is mostly true, we're rather shielded from the physical world. We're, we're, we're protected from the elements. We're able to manage getting water and getting even environmental controls like heating and air conditioning. We, we are, are able to grow food or livestock so that all we need to do if we're hungry is we go to a supermarket or a fast food restaurant. Everything is just there for us. The world is an easy place. Well, for most of human history and even in still many parts of the world today, the world is not so easy. It is a very tenuous existence trying to navigate life when the world seems out to get you. The world really honestly wants to kill you. And if that sounds dramatic, try walking out into the forest for a few days with nothing else other than to rely on the forest. Now, some of you may be trained to do that. Most people would say <laughs> you will encounter the way the world just doesn't like us. <laughs> right. And how do you navigate that? How do you navigate even the bigger questions of it rains regularly at a certain point and then some years it doesn't? Well, what do we do? Well, it, the, the very things that we think are predictable become not predictable or earthquakes or volcanoes or droughts or go down the list. Pandemics, right? Diseases pop up. And even in our very controlled era, we find ourselves susceptible to the fact that there's realities of this world that try to get us and we begin to panic. Can we get a sense of what these people feel like? Well, how do you respond to that? Life is precarious. And if life is precarious, the goal of finding some kind of purpose or understanding is, is about navigating that precariousness and finding something to center it, something secure, something helpful that can guide people and say, well, life is trouble, but here's some rules, here's some categories. And the other element of this is that it was very physical. People's needs weren't these emotional angst about what does it mean to be a person? It was how do I eat? How do I drink? How do I stay warm when it's below freezing? Very physical kind of questions which led to very physical kinds of needs and prayers. And for the most part, people were dealing with a world they didn't understand. They knew how to get some things done. But for the most part, the, the technicalities and details of why, why is it raining? What is an earthquake? Why do crops grow the way they do? All the things of human life and, and physical experience. Why does the sun rise? Why does the sun set? What, what happens if it stops doing that? All these things are unexplained. And so they're trying to navigate having to predict life so that they can succeed in it while not understanding how to deal with it. What causes disease? Well, how do we know? We don't know. So what do we do in response? We do what we can. But all of this leaves people very vulnerable to the world. It leaves people very vulnerable to the world and very vulnerable to other people because in trying to compete for resources and trying to compete for power, everyone's sort of at edge and everyone's on edge because they're feeling this precariousness so the goal then is to try to secure as much safety as possible one big way of doing that when we don't understand the world is say 
there must be someone in charge. So this is, we see the rise of religious perspectives that involve polytheism and pantheism. Polytheism is having a lot of gods. A very simplistic way of understanding the rise of that is thinking if you go to a store or you go to a restaurant and someone doesn't give you good service or you want better service, you say, who's, can I talk to the manager? You want to, we want to talk to someone. We want to blame someone. We want to appeal to someone. We want, we want to go to the authority. And that's the same way with life. If life is not understandable, we want to appeal to the authority that can help us either overcome a problem or have a more predictable positive experience. And so everything has its own God. Everyone has, everything has its own manager. And you have a God of this and a God of that and a God of this other thing. The pictures off to the left there are uh, my favorite pantheon. Uh, that's Thor. His dad, Odin, of course. So I've, I, for some reason, I'm drawn to Norse mythology. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, but it's just these are all these different societies came up with different versions of trying to navigate the world to help them have some kind of predictability, some kind of response. Even if we're, and this is so common in, in even today's news. If something, if there's some kind of major disaster, there's a, always a little bit of discussion on the disaster. But then there's a lot of discussion. What can we do to make this not happen again? Often times there's nothing we can do it's just this is how life is but we have this yearning to somehow make it right and make it more predictable pantheism is going a little bit a different way it's not that there's someone in charge of it it's that the the world itself is alive and so if you want to appeal to the tree you don't talk to the tree's manager for fruit you talk to the tree itself is this divine presence and you begin worshiping nature all of these things again are ways to navigate the precariousness of life in a world of uncertainty and trying to add some level of emotional and spiritual response that can help us feel more comfortable and confident in the physical so the tendency is to divinize nature to say okay the world is out to get us let's worship it or another way is to say is it to dismiss it altogether and this was another common approach in a lot of philosophies in ancient times which is to say the physical stuff isn't our real person our physical stuff is just the shell our real self is the spiritual the soul this internal thing we can and we can continue to see real, uh, other world religions that's, that have share, continue this basic perspective it's this dismissiveness of this physical stuff because it's untrustworthy it's not dependable so let's get rid of it the pre-modern questions really wrestle with do we differ nature do we dismiss this who do we talk to who's in charge how do we navigate the precariousness of life it really was a a reality of dealing with fear fear of nature gave way to fear of god so that god's presence in this world gave hope to being sheltered from nature's domination the idea that god is creator wasn't a debate about when it happened or uh, the the pattern it was who's in charge god yahweh i am is in charge of all things if you have a problem, who do you go to? Who can we trust? God. God is in charge of all of it. And we can have God's promise that we are going to continue. Well, how can we trust God? Well, the theology develops these patterns of understanding how God can be involved in nature, but not dependent on nature. Let's move into modernity. I'm a little concerned right now about your salvation and stuff. How come you have not been baptized? Because I never got around to it, okay? I don't know why you always have to be judging me. Because I only believe in science. But tonight, we are going up against Satan's caveman. And I just thought it would be a good idea. I like that clip. It's a little problematic, but I like it because it so nicely encapsulates that crisis between the pre-modern and the modern era. The fear, the fear of uncertainty. You do the religious acts in order to overcome the fear, in order to give yourself some kind of advantage in the case of uncertainty. But then there's others who say, I don't believe in that. I just believe in science. Well, the modern era really is this way of science. And in the, the modern era, the development of knowledge and science and other understanding helped humans shift from being afraid of the world. 
so the world is always something to be the, the, the world is always trying to dominate or the world is always in controls and now people realized oh through science through technology we can actually start responding to the world we can overcome the world we can not only protect ourselves from the world we can dominate the world we can make the world serve us that is a radically huge shift the world now is afraid of humanity well that is a big think of the emotional ability to say no longer are we afraid but we will take control that's a huge psychological reality and it then impacts every other kind of human approach we think that every problem then every crisis every issue every category of human knowledge whether it's the physical world or human psychology or sociology or history all of these things can be effectively figured out and solved through the use of reason how does that work well you start with a small thing and you build your knowledge upon that you've discovered the basic rules and laws these think of physics or chemistry whether there's these basic things that fit together then you start applying that to everything else and you think well if we can just apply those rules and laws just like with nature to everything else then we don't have to deal with the kinds of chaos that human societies have caused through the year we can actually rise above that not only in physical ways but in emotional spiritual and aesthetic ways so foundationalism becomes this approach of building knowledge upon knowledge so that you don't always have to start from scratch either you you have generational knowledge that builds on each other and this knowledge is dependent on the idea that there's universal rules there's general rules there's these categories every gravity isn't different in different parts of the world and different cultures because gravity is just how things are so too they thought these universal rules of science also have universal rules throughout and we just have to figure these out in doing that in science they actually learn to take these universal rules and apply them in increasingly complex and particular ways to solve some major crises to solve some major problems but also to cause some major uh complications because warfare became immensely more technological and damaging and all the rest so the challenge in this, the, the way of coming to terms with a rising knowledge was seen through a, a few ways. And one of them was, was a dialectic. This is an ancient form of knowledge, but it is also a, a way of navigating the crises of the human world in the modern era of say there's two tendencies there's a left side and the right side well both sides are tending towards extremes so you take the thesis the antithesis and you find well what is the common ground with that there's a synthesis so people would do this as with religion say all these religions think they're talking about something but but they're all really trying to say the same thing and so how can we boil them down and have this universal understanding of human yearning or human knowledge and not have to deal with a supernatural, not have to deal with the chaos that religious battles have done? The tendency, though, in the modern era is to think in very binary ways because you're trying to categorize it because there's universal rules there seems to be an on or off right and wrong up or down and this binary thinking is actually very helpful in, in trying to come to a general understanding of life but the, the problem is when things don't fit neatly into those binaries you have to shove them in sophisticated unsophisticated cultured uncultured now you can see where the rise of colonialism actually begins to reflect this because you have the sophisticated sophisticated supposedly sophisticated advanced European countries who had a lot of good military power and they would come in and say oh there's these poor countries in these other parts of the world they don't know any better here let us take over oh I know you're going to resist but you don't know better let us help you understand the ways of humanity which of course has all sorts of problems which we're aware of now the binary thinking became a a way of efficiently addressing problems but it added to some more problems this also began the a rise of atheism because once reason became applied to every kind of human knowledge and defending God became a a reasoned approach and, and not that God is with is somehow outside of reason but when you make God in terms of philosophical proofs and define God's nature within these proofs then the God's own identity then becomes dependent 
seemingly on these proofs and if good arguments are made in the contrary well then why do we need god and that's what happens so no longer life isn't precarious so we don't need god's physical help so god becomes a philosophical option and when you have a philosophical option you could reason them out life is good right and there's also competition because when when the goal is to dominate the world and dominate and assert power then people see life in terms of competition gaining and asserting and and seeing everyone else sort of in the struggle for survival and struggle for control and struggle to assert their power of reason struggle to concern their power of their will their power of their physical way so the dominant becomes a category versus the dominated you can see you see this binary every you're in these one or the other kind of categories you want to be part of the dominant and you want to show your dominant by dominating Again, this is exactly how then the modern era treats the world itself. This isn't just human societies. This is how the world is impacted. You, do, you are either dominated by the world and succumb to its pressures, or you take control. You take control of the resources. You take control of the science so that you make the world bend to what you want it to do. Nature then became something to be subdued and conquered. In modernity, humanity learned how to oppress nature. Technology and science gave insights into the ways of this world. And with this insight came a new stance toward the world, one of domination rather than intimidation. Now, before I go on, let me say that this is certainly not all negative. There is significant amounts of progress. The very I fact I am talking on this video to you wherever you are at is a expression of the kind of development that happened in the modern era there is great possibilities great resources great ways of helping people rise out of poverty the the kinds of science that addressed farming techniques or new kinds of seeds or go down or medical advances all these things are good but they're not altogether 100% divinely good. They are. They show the way that progress and advancement can also reflect in damaging ways. And these damaging ways became so apparent in the in the 20th century, especially in World War One, and then sort of the the nail in the coffin of the modern era of of in after World War Two when people realized all this understanding was leading us to a place of continued barbarianism and in the late 20th century the realization we could actually entirely annihilate the world and there were people who seemed willing to do that that's a problem so we move into what's called post-modern era the question of ultimate reality in ourselves continues but rather than say we're afraid of the world as the pre-modern era did so let's dominate the world as as the modern era did, the postmodern says, how can we get along with world, the world? How can we cooperate with the world? We're not afraid of it, but we also see that we can cause so much damage that we destroy ourselves. We need to work in communion with the creation. We need to be attentive to our responsibility to the world and be attentive to how the world has a kind of wisdom in, that God made in creation so that we are functioning, so that we are healing and helping rather than controlling, dominating, and destroying. Simple answers aren't enough. Then. They address the world, but they don't address our experiences. Th that's the problem with trying to make these general rules apply to history or society. Humanity is so much more complex than that. And trying to mandate certain general approaches to very broad swaths of things ends up causing more chaos. Mm -hmm. war, history is a great example. You couldn't just boil things down. And one culture is not necessarily more advanced than, than another. There's strengths and weaknesses in every culture. And when, when one tries to say, we're the only culture with, that, that matters, everyone follow us, then those strengths may be applied but the weaknesses then magnify and and those who are being subdued or dominated feel the weight and burden of that and then it causes chaos in so many other ways and so what we're realizing is the genuine strength that comes out of the variety and complexity of the world and the complexity of human society and the diversity of human society aren't problems to be overcome but they're benefits to explore and deepen and listen to 
And as part of that, one of the earliest postmodern critiques was that you cannot rely on what are called meta narratives. This idea that there's this overarching story that then applies to everyone and everyone shoved into this. No, that becomes a tool for power because if I'm saying, here's your story, here's you who you are, that's me controlling you and me not actually being attentive to what God is doing in you or doing among you or the strengths you offer. So rather than say there's a meta narrative, it's there's a multiplicity of narratives. And we, we try to then fight and push against the kinds of power structures that, that try to constrict the complexity for their own power. But then, of course, that leads to the question, is there truth? And versions of postmodernity, versions of, of this that especially got a lot of attention because I think they're, they're very dramatic and sweeping, ask the question, is there truth? And, and which leads into the questions of relativism, the idea that there is no truth, there, there's no common thread, which is, of course, a, a very enticing kind of understanding when we're fighting against the power structures, but it also itself is limited because it's, it, it's, it's creating a new kind of meta narrative that's saying that there is no common thread. But breaking down the meta narratives and the, and the deconstruction that happened were as important, but we can't stop there because if we stop there, then we're these disconnected existences that have no common narrative or story or area of unity, which is problematic in general, but is especially problematic in light of Christian theology. There is relative perspectives, but th not everything is relative. There is a God is creator idea that causes a common theme. And that brings us back to understanding, well, okay, there's complexity and there's relative positions, but is there a way of organizing this knowledge so that it's not just what's just meaningless or empty or whatever, everyone's truth is their own truth. Can we actually build on it? Which is of course how we function in, in life. The, the Anglo-American approach to postmodernity, I, I think was a lot more uh, attentive to the idea of complexity and, and probably because of the history, right? You have the European history of World War II and other places that, that caused us like, we don't trust power at all. We don't trust power structures because they're inherently uh, problematic. Whereas the, some approaches say, well, you can have a problematic portion, but there's still an element of truth and knowledge that can come through. And so in seeing knowledge not as foundation, you build on this, and in general terms, see it as a web. There's interconnected forms of knowledge that can be adjusted, but there's still a form that creates a structure. And there's a complexity of that knowledge that, that actually embraces variety. Think in terms of ecology. Uh, I currently live now in a mountain area where there's trees and birds and plants and other area and other things. And all these things over the eons have developed so that they interact, so that they, these are the kinds of birds and trees and plants that function at about a mile high in altitude and in Southern California uh, and all the rest. And so there, this complexity is very interactive. And one of the things we learned from the modern area is if you, you, you destroy one part, you actually undermine the complexity. And in undermining the complexity, everything is affected. Mm -hmm. So just like with knowledge, Knowledge can have a lot of different parts. It doesn't mean it's all relative. It doesn't mean it's meaningless. It just means that there's an interconnectivity of it so that even a seemingly small part can have a major influence. And being attentive to that complexity then allows us to build knowledge in a more substantive, helpful way that allows us to say, how can we actually cooperate within the variety so that we can reinforce each other? True moderation consists, not as many people seem to think, in always thinking the middle between two, any two points, which is what the, the dialectic try to do, but in trying to recognize the point of truth and holding to it. What is the key element of human life that theology is teaching us to bring this back to a question of theology? What is the revelation of God? Well, now here's our center around which then we can see God's work happening in different ways and in different patterns. And these shouldn't be resisted. These actually should be embraced. It's in listening to each of you. I learn more and more and more about the complex interactivity of the work of God in different situations. By participating together in integrated life that no longer pursues dominance or independence, we can begin to bring both healing to the destruction and find new understanding of God who is leading us to an integrity with all that God has done and made. That is an inviting 
aspect. And rather than calling it a postmodern, maybe we can call it the ec an ecological era where we're trying to not just be attentive to nature, but be attentive to all of creation so that together in light of what God has made and who God has called to be us to be and how God is offering renewal, we can bring thriving to everyone. That gets me excited. That gets me excited about studying God and theology and learning more and more along the way. And that's exactly what I see this course doing, digging into it. We learn together so that we can function better together, so that we can grow together. So taking all of that, the, the pneumatological triangulation and then being filled out in the philosophical sense that they did, each assignment in your forms, in the papers, in however we're constructing this, this, this class, think in terms of these three triangulating approaches to discernment. How do it we understand God? What does it mean to be in communion with God? We have to think in terms of orthodoxy, orthopathy, orthopraxy. When you read something, think about what does this mean in terms of beliefs? What does it mean in terms of emotions? What do I think about this? What are they thinking? What do I feel about this? What feeling is this being driven out of? What do I feel called to do in response to this? What are they leading me to do? Now, in, in a lot of traditional theology, the first one will be an easier one, and the second two, you'll have to use your own discernment and wrestling. My dissertation was, was, a, was an example of me taking Moltmann's theology and saying, now, what does this lead us to do? Here are examples of people who are doing something that reflects what he is proposing. And so that's the task, learning how to think in terms of orthodoxy, orthopathy, orthopraxy in every element. What's the right understanding about this? What's the right feeling about this context? What's the right action in response? We instinctively do these, think in these three ways as we live our lives. We're whole people with, with thoughts, feelings, and actions. This is, this is naturally human, but we're not really trained to do this in an academic environment. We're not certainly trained to do this often in a theology or church environment, but I think that's key. So the goal is to learn how to apply this to theological reasoning and analysis, to go beyond thinking that being a good Christian or having an orthodox approach is enough. Being a good Christian involves our thoughts, certainly, being orthodox, but that doesn't make us put us in right standing with Jesus. Satan has a right understanding about Jesus but is Jesus' enemy. We also have to have the right feelings as we participate with the Spirit. The, the, and in certain contexts, some contexts we're in, we'll be feeling anger and frustration because that's the, that's the attitude that Jesus would have to that context. And we also have to have the right response. So reasoning analysis has to take stock of our thoughts, our feelings, and our practices, and have these conform to the work of the Spirit. We've been taught to limit our conception of theology to our thoughts and beliefs, which then creates a separation from our lived experience. So the first key to contemporary Christian theology is integration. Integrating our thoughts, feelings, and actions as a holistic expression of our faith. In our readings, in the lectures, you'll be confronted with a lot of thoughts, and the challenge for you is to learn how to integrate this in your life. I'm not going to hand this over to you. I'm not going to say, here's the right thoughts, now go and do this thing. Maybe sometimes I will. I'm not going to say, here's a deep, complex teaching. Now, what are we supposed to feel? What is this? What feeling is this coming out of? What question uh, or hurt may this be derived from? For, for instance, the question of uh, God's power is often driven by an experience of God's lack or where God's uh, distance and suffering. So your challenge is to be proactive in saying, well, what is, what is the orthopathy? What is the orthopraxy? And Apply this to your context. In your responses, say, now this is what this means for me. Which leads to another question. What is your faith? What do you have faith in? So we all have a theology. The question is whether it's a good theology and having integrity with our lives and the world and is coherent with ourself, with itself. So the task of this course is to consider Christianity in a thoughtful way looking at current expressions of theology in light of the questions that are behind our present era. And with this then, the bigger goal, and this, the, the first part is what I'm going to do mostly. The second part then is really your responsibility and my invitation to you is to apply this thoughtfulness to our lives, to your life, internal and external, living out the faith that we claim we have. <laughs>